Just before we get started today, a bit of a special plug. One of the most regular writers for this channel, Gilles Messier, has written a book and it's available now. If the notion of an old timey scam artist plying his trade via Telegram, not the app, a real old school telegram sounds like a fun premise for a novel, then look no further than Calling All Stations. Set in 1921, Calling All Stations follows the adventures of Edward Hawkins, a 12 year old English boy who is kidnapped by his veteran father and imprisoned on a remote Scottish lighthouse. A radio set and tattered copy of Treasure Island are his only windows to the world, and he dreams of escaping to a life of adventure on the high seas. What 12 year old doesn't? Then, one day, a mysterious radio signal launches Edward on a harrowing odyssey that takes him from the bleak shores of Scotland to the deserts of Morocco during the brutal Rift War, the treacherous world of rogues and bandits that will take all of his courage and cunning to survive. It's a thrilling yarn in the tradition of classic adventure novels. It's a great read, and also it's written by one of my favorite writers. So you could support their writing career, get a great novel out of it. It's a win-win. There are links below. Please go and buy it. And now, today's video. Climb to the second floor of the School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, and you will encounter a bizarre and seemingly out of place object. On a small table, encased in a clear bell jar, stands a small glass funnel filled with a dark, shiny substance resembling molasses. From its neck hangs a single glassy black drop, precariously suspended as if caught at the moment of falling. But no matter how long and how hard you stare at the drop, it does not grow and it does not drip into the waiting beaker below. It remains frozen in place, as if time inside the bell jar has somehow stopped. While at first you might assume that this is some kind of avant-garde art installation, it is in fact a scientific experiment. But despite appearances, the black substance, a kind of tar or pitch, is actually flowing through the funnel, albeit very, very slowly, with a drop breaking off approximately every decade. First started in 1930 and spanning generations, the University of Queensland Pitch Drop is the longest continuously running scientific experiment in the world, and one that dramatically illuminates humanity's complicated relationship with time. Pitch refers to a variety of highly viscous polymers composed of a mixture of complex hydrocarbon. Traditionally produced by heating wood and used to waterproof ships and houses, pitch is also produced as a byproduct of coal and petroleum distillation, in which case it is typically referred to as tar, asphalt, or bitumen. While thick and syrupy when heated at room temperature, pitch hardens into a brittle solid even shattering like glass when struck with a hammer. Indeed, solid tar is classified as a glass for resin regular window glass. The molecules in pitch are not arranged randomly and do not take on a regular crystalline structure. Structure. At this point, you might remember learning in school that glass is, in fact, an extremely thick liquid and will slowly flow under the force of gravity, hence why the windows on medieval cathedrals are thicker at the bottom. But alas, this oft-told fun fact is... In fact, just a myth. In the medieval period, panes of glass were made by spinning and flattening discs or rondels of molten glass against a flat surface and cutting them square. This produced panes with a tapered cross section, the thicker edge of which were placed at the bottom of the window frames for added structural strength. At room temperature, ordinary glass does not flow appreciably under gravity. Pitch, however, does, and the University of Queensland experiment was designed to demonstrate this effect. The pitch drop was the brainchild of University of Queensland's physics professor, Tom Thomas Parnell, who set up the experiment in 1927. But Parnell was not the first to demonstrate the peculiar properties of pitch. In the late 19th century, the great British scientist William Thomson, better known as Lord Kelvin, placed some lead bullets atop a piece of pitch and some corks below. Over several decades, the bullets sank to the bottom while the corks floated to the top. Kevin also built a model glacier composed of pitch on a wooden ramp, which over time flowed and formed the same pattern as real life glaciers. In Parnell's version, pitch was heated and poured into a sealed glass funnel, then allowed to settle for three years. Then, in October 1930, Pennell broke open the funnel's neck, allowing the pitch to start flowing. From that moment, the pitch began its excruciatingly slow journey through the funnel, the first drop breaking off in December 1938. This was followed by a second drop in February 1947, a third in April 1954, and a fourth in May 1962. The drops occurred an average of 7.9 years apart. By this time, however, Professor Parnell had passed away, and the pitch drop experiment languished in a cupboard, forgotten, and 
and gathering dust. Then in 1961, it was rediscovered by physics professor John Mainston, who convinced the university to put it on public display. The strange experiment soon gained something of a cult following with students, staff, and curious visitors eager to witness the once-in-a-decade spectacle of a pitch drop falling. Under Mainstow's tenure, three more drops would fall, although in an absurdly comical series of events, every single one went unobserved. In April 1979, the sixth drop fell during a weekend when the campus was deserted, while in July 1988, the seventh fell while the experiment was being displayed at the Brisbane World Exposition. As Mainston, who was carefully monitoring the experiment, later recalled, I decided that I needed a cup of tea or something like that, walked away, came back, and lo and behold, it had dropped. One becomes a bit philosophical about this, and I just said, Oh well, let's be patient. Determined to finally see a drop fall with his own eyes in 2000, Mainston arranged to have a webcam permanently aimed at the experiment. But in yet another infuriating case of Murphy's Law in action, the eighth pitch drop in November 2000 went unrecorded when the camera was knocked out by a 20-minute power outage because, well, of course it was. But there was some consolation to be had, for in October 2005, Mainston and the late Thomas Parnell were awarded the Ig Nobel Prize in Physics, a parody of the Nobel Prize that aims to honor achievements that first made people laugh and then made people think. Mainston was delighted to receive the award, commenting, I am sure that Thomas Parnell would have been flattered to know that Mark Anderson considers him worthy to become a recipient of an Ig Nobel Prize. Professor Parnell's award citation would of course have to applaud the new record he had thereby established for the longest lead time between the performance of a seminal scientific experiment and the conferral of such an award, be it a Nobel or an Ig Nobel Prize. But while Mainston was more than willing to wait another decade for the next drop, alas, it was not to be, for in August 2013 he passed away from a stroke, having never seen a single drop in over 50 years of watching and waiting. With Mainston's death, stewardship of the pitch drop experiment fell to Professor Andrew White, who by this time faced a number of new challenges. Firstly, air conditioning had recently been installed in the physics department, lowering the pitch's temperature and lengthening the average gap between drops from 8 to 12 years. Secondly, over the previous 70 years, the eight pitch drops had piled up inside the receiving beaker, meaning that instead of making a clean break, the eighth drop collided with the seventh and remained stuck in place, taking another 13 years to tip over out of the way. As White explained in a 2014 interview, John Mainston, the former custodian and I, had discussed over the years the best thing to do to keep the experiment going for another 80 years. We decided the best time to make room for the next few drops to fall would be soon after the ninth drop touched down. And so in April 2014, White attempted to lift the funnel, remove the existing beaker of drops before the ninth drop could fuse itself to them, and replace it with a new beaker. However, while removing the bell jar, White jostled the funnel, causing the ninth drop to break loose. Despite this mishap, White remained optimistic, stating, Open questions are how many years it will take to form a bulb, and will it go back to the older cycle of every eight years, or will it stay on the new 13-year period? The old beaker with drops 1 to 9 is now displayed beside the experiment, which is monitored 24-7 by no fewer than three webcams. Currently, more than 25,000 viewers from 158 countries are registered on the university's live web stream in the hopes of finally witnessing the historic 10th drop. However, as this is not expected to occur until sometime in 2026, the honor of producing the world's first observed pitch drop instead went to another identical experiment begun at Trinity College Dublin in October 1944. The identity of the faculty member who set up the experiment has been lost to time, but they are believed to have been a colleague of Nobel Prize winning Irish physicist Ernest Walton, the first person to successfully split the atom. The pitch used in the Trinity College experiment is slightly less viscous than in the University of Queensland setup, meaning that by 2000 the funnel had produced eight drops despite starting 14 years later. In the summer of 2013, college staff noticed that a ninth drop was about to fall and three webcams were aimed at the funnel. Then on July the 18th, 2013, at 5 pm Irish Standard Time, the ninth drop finally broke free, this time witnessed by thousands of online spectators. Dr. Shane Bergen, a physicist and senior research fellow at Trinity College, recalled the electric atmosphere as the world waited for the drop to fall. Eventually, when R1 was caught on camera, it provided the world with a kind of scientific ah moment. As in, finally. We see it. In a world where we expect to expect things to happen very quickly and stuff is demanded of us instantaneously, it's a little quirky to think that a lot of stuff just happens on a timescale that's much slower 
than we can normally appreciate. While waiting 70 years to watch a blob of black goo fall might seem like watching paint dry cracked to 11, as Dr. Kostya Trachenko of Queen Mary University in London explains, it could be a lot worse. If you put it in the fridge, it would take thousands of years. For a theorist like myself, 70 years is actually not that long. In addition to finally providing the world with an elusive once-a-decade spectacle, the ninth drop of the Trinity College experiment also allowed the viscosity of the pitch to be precisely calculated as 20 billion times that of water. As previously mentioned, the pitch used in the University of Queensland experiment is even thicker, clocking in at 230 billion times the viscosity of water. While such results might seem purely academic, Dr. Tritenko insists that they have practical applications. For example, nuclear waste is often encased in glass before burial, a process known as vitrification. Experiments like the University of Queensland and Trinity College pitch drops, Trachenko argues, offer valuable insights into the potential behavior of glasses over the vast timescales required to keep such waste safely contained. And for more on this, please check out our previous video, How Does Nuclear Waste Disposal Work? Apart from its purely scientific merits, the University of Queensland pitch drop holds the Guinness World Record for the world's longest continuously running science experiment at 92 years and counting as of this recording. While another pitch drop experiment was set up at Aberystwyth University in Wales in 1914, 16 years before the University of Queensland experiment, the pitch used was considerably more viscous and in 108 years of operation has produced not a single drop, nor is it expected to, for over a thousand years. So, officially speaking at least, the University of Queensland experiment still reigns supreme. But when it comes to the world's longest running experiments, the pitch drop is in good company. The next runner-up is the Oxford Electric Bell, a curious apparatus set up in the lobby of the Clarendon Laboratory at the University of Oxford. First published in 1840 by physicist and clergyman Robert Walker, the experiment consists of two small brass bells, between which hangs a 4mm diameter spherical brass clapper suspended on a chain. This clapper is in turn connected to a pair of dry cell batteries. When the clapper contacts one of the bells, it completes a circuit and produces an electrostatic charge which repels the clapper and propels it towards the other bell. While the voltage required to accomplish this is high, each cycle transfers only a tiny amount of charge from the batteries, allowing the Oxford electric bell to ring near continuously at a frequency of 2 Hz for 182 years. While you may recognize this as significantly longer than the University of Queensland pitch drop experiment, note also the term near continuously. Being dependent on electrostatic charges, the bell cannot function when the humidity is too high and has thus experienced numerous brief stoppages throughout its lifetime. Nonetheless, the bell has rung an estimated 10 billion times and holds the Guinness World Record as the world's most durable battery-delivering ceaseless tintinabulation. And while originally intended as a mere curiosity, devices like the Oxford Electric Bell played a minor but important role in the development of the theories of electrostatics and electrochemistry. Curiously, the exact composition of the batteries, which are sealed in molten sulfur to insulate and waterproof them, is unknown. Based on records from the period the bell was produced, however, it's believed that the batteries are in fact Zamboni piles developed by Italian inventor Giuseppe Zamboni in 1812. Such batteries are composed of thousands of alternating layers of metal foil and discs of paper soaked in manganese dioxide. While nobody knows how long the bell will continue to ring, its incredible longevity thus far is enough to frustrate any cell phone owner whose battery struggles to last even for a day. In a close third place for the world's longest running experiment is appropriate a clock owned by the Department of Physics at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Built in 1864 by Arthur Beverley, the Beverley clock does not require manual winding, instead using fluctuations in atmospheric temperature and pressure to wind itself. The mechanism of the clock incorporates a sealed one cubic foot chamber with a diaphragm at one end. Changes in pressure and temperature cause the air inside the chamber to expand and contract, pushing the diaphragm in and out. The diaphragm is in turn linked to a chain and ratchet system which continuously winds the clock and keeps the mechanism running without human intervention. While 1864 is also much earlier than the pitch drop experiment's 1930 start date, like the Oxford Electric Bell, the Beverly Clock has not actually run continuously, being stopped on numerous occasions for cleaning, maintenance, or to be moved when the physics department changed locations. Furthermore, if the temperature or atmospheric pressure remains stable for too long, the gas expansion chamber will not produce enough energy to rewind the mechanism, causing the clock to stop until atmospheric conditions begin to fluctuate again. Long-term experiments are also not exclusive to 
the field of physics in 1979, American botanist William James Beale started one of the longest experiments in biology at Michigan State University. Beale filled 20 glass bottles with a mixture of sand and seeds from 21 different plant species, then buried them in the ground in the university's botanical garden that now bears his name. The goal of the experiment was to unearth a bottle every five years, plant the seeds, and record how many of the seeds actually sprouted. The experiment continued long after Beale's death in 1924, with later custodians extending the study by unearthing the bottles every 10 and later every 20 years. The latest bottle was unearthed on April 15, 2021, with the last expected to be unearthed and planted in 2100. That's 221 years after it was buried. A similarly long-lasting experiment was started in July 2004 by Charles Cockle and Ralph Moller of the University of Edinburgh to study the longevity of the extremely hardy bacteria and hard to pronounce Karoko City opus and bacillus subtilis the team desiccated or dried out a number of samples of each species and stored them at the collections in the university of edinburgh and the london natural history museum with one set of samples being stored in a lead box to study the effects of ionizing background radiation every two years over the next 24 years a set of samples will be opened and cultured and the number of viable bacterial colonies will be counted providing insight into just how long these organisms can survive in extreme environments such as deserts caves and permafrost but while such long-term biological studies might generate more useful and relevant scientific data being dependent on human labor they lack the mystique of experiments like the university of queensland pitch drop the oxford electric bell and the beverly clock the former of which is estimated to hold enough pitch to last another 1500 years generations of humans will come and go wars will be fought borders will shift and sea levels will rise and fall but these experiments will carry on at their own unhurried pace slowly dripping ringing and ticking away into eternity.